What do you believe to be high performance? High performance, it's a good question. I think it's working to a certain level and keeping that consistency. So there's many people who jump up to a certain level who, who perform highly for a day, two, week, two weeks, three weeks, but then they can let it slip and dwell on the success or the achievement that they've just, just achieved. I think high performance is achieving something and not dwelling on that, but staying consistent, staying disciplined and keeping going. And a lot of people, I think, do have that consistency to keep going, but there's many people who, who let it drift. So I, th I think it's something we all have, but we, um, we drop off every now and then, you know? So how do you marry that up with what you do? Because you go on these amazing adventures. Yeah. They might last weeks or months, but then you're home and then you're looking for more funding or you're planning the next trip or you're doing loads of media. Does the way you live your life differ, apart from the obvious, differ mm. when you're here to when you're out on your expeditions or is your consistency and an overall approach to life? And if so, what is that? Yeah, it does differ, especially towards the early adventures you know, where it kind of be reckless, no funding, no budget, not even posting or promoting on social media, just doing it for the pure love and passion of taking on a cool adventure. But then as that kind of built and I needed to now start to promote these expeditions and adventures because that's what you need to do to try to follow your passion and make a career of it, the whole sort of ball game changed. And when I then came back home, I wasn't kicking my heels and planning the next straight away. I had like, it was 50% adventure. And then when I got back home, it was busy with the 50% of, of business. And, and you're right, you know, with the logistics and finding funding uh, and putting the next big expedition together, which requires immense teamwork as well, you know? So it has changed dramatically. But now when I return, um, I, I stay busy for the next big thing. Very good. So I was thinking that I really helpful way for our listeners on this Ash, mm. is is to share a model that we've used in the past on the uh, uh, on the podcast yeah. from um the the famous sociologist joseph campbell talks about the call to adventure the hero's journey mm. and a really ni nice way we explain it is five stages of the dream stage where right. you come up with the ambition the yeah. leap stage of actually making it happen the fight stage where you get stuck in the middle of it, mm -hmm. the climb where you see progress, and then finally the arrival stage. Yeah. Now, given some of the amazing adventures that you've been on, I, I, I was thinking it'd be helpful to say, take take the uh, adventure you did on the Yangtze River yeah. and look at it through that lens of those five stages. So if we can start with the dream stage, yeah. where on earth do you get an idea to, to go along the world's longest river from? Oh, God, it, it's... It's such a big story, to be honest. I think I'd probably have to take you back to when I first started traveling altogether. Um, you know, I come from a normal background. There's no military background. There's no university degree, no financial background. I just worked multiple jobs in Wales, fish and chip shop, as a waiter, as a lifeguard, you name it. I sold my little car, which was like a Renault Clio. I bought myself a bicycle, cycled to and from work every day, grinding about 240 hours a month to save up the funds that I needed to head off traveling. And it wasn't a lot, but when I set out for traveling, I would say that's when I really started to find my niche and passion for adventure. I was doing reckless uh, and often dangerous early adventures like what like crossing borders illegally with no visa you know from purchasing a 10 pound bicycle because that's all we could afford and cycling the entire length of cambodia and, and vietnam with no pump with no puncture repair kit with no map <laughs> a tent that wasn't waterproof it was just reckless stuff you know we were living off noodles um we then learned how to survive in the jungle with the burmese hill tribe and that's where we actually utilized the jungle and crossed from thailand into myanmar in 2010 when it's shut down it's illegal for western and you say it. we who, who <clears throat> me and my best mate matt norman we both set off together from north wales and, and started these early adventures with one another um and this kind of led me on to take different sort of adventures tame adventures adventures that didn't require much planning or much funding at all we kind of just got sick of being on the tourist route sharing the same photos stories and experiences and we kind of wanted to create our own unique experiences and Why? stories i think it was because initially when i was back home and as a youngster 
I would hear of people's stories about the world traveling and I'd be fascinated. I'd watch shows like the David Attenborough program and I didn't want to watch it on TV. I wanted to be out there amongst it, you know. I'd see images of the Great Wall of China or the Himalayas and, and I'd want to be out there trekking them. So I always had this big fascination of going out there and exploring the world, not only the world, but the traditions and the culture. And myself as well, you know, seeing how I handle certain scenarios and situations. Um, and I think when I found myself on the tourist route, I found that I wasn't getting that. I was getting a minibus full of Westerners from all over the world. I wasn't integrating and, and conversing with the locals. I wasn't seeing how they live out in in Vietnam, for example, because I was always like on that tourist path. So I was like, Matt, my, my friend, I was like, Matt, we need to we need to do something different. You know, and I remember having this talk with him on the Mekong Riverbank in, in Cambodia. We were both sulking because we'd spent way too much money than we anticipated. As I said, it was a shoestring budget that we were on. And I said, look, we need to get off this beaten track. We need to, I don't know, do an adventure of our own. How about we get the most ridiculous looking bicycles we can find and we cycle the entire length of Cambodia and Vietnam. And we were both 19, you know, late teenagers. And my friend laughed, you know, it's like, sounds good, you know, but, but what bikes? And as he said that, we heard this sort of screeching noise behind us. We turned around and there's this skinny, small, frail old lady cycling this ridiculous looking bicycle, but it looked like what we could afford. So I said, perfect, look, it looks about five, 10 pound. We can, we can do it. You know, let's get two of those and, and let's go. You know, wow. this bike was made for going to work and back. It wasn't made to cycle over 1,100 miles an entire country. See, but what fascinates me on that, like, I love it and I want to explore, this, like, mm. like, the adventure, but where did you draw the line then between stubbornness and recklessness? That's a very good question. I think, I think they were a good 50-50. You know, I think I was stubborn. I didn't want to quit, so I would go those extra um, few hours pushing myself and, you know, I remember once we, we crossed the border, uh, we realized it was a long way back and we, I was like, oh, come on, we'll be fine. Let's just keep going. But the authorities came after us and told us to go back to get a stamp. <laughs> they didn't punish us or anything, you know. So I think, that, you know, it, it was reckless to a certain degree like that, you know, where I just didn't really think of the consequences. I was just like, I'm sure we'll find a way through. I'm sure everything will be OK, uh, which I probably needed at that time. But if I still had that mentality now, I'd be locked up or, or dead, you know, I think, going to these different countries. So I did have to change the, the mentality and realise that actually a lot of teamwork is involved and it needs to be, you know, you need to um, be attentive to the details in order to succeed on these much bigger expeditions, which are a matter of life and death, not necessarily completing or failing an adventure, you know. I applaud the optimism. I love the yeah. fact that you just thought things were going to be okay. Um, my little boy, Sebastian, yeah. is, an, is adventure obsessed. I mentioned to him that I was talking to a real life explorer and adventurer. So he's only six. His eyes lit up. Oh, so nice. We, he's watching Ed Stafford all the time. Yeah, yeah. He loves it. Every time we play a game, and I'm like, what's the password for the game? He's like, Ed Stafford. <laughs> um, That's so cool. What, what should we be doing to make him have that mindset of optimism that he can do anything? Because... We, what we find in our experience is we're joined by lots of guests that say, oh, as a youngster, I believed anything was possible. As I got older, I realised that wasn't mm. the case. Whereas you still seem to have the mindset of a six-year-old child that, of course, it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, we can do something wrong, but it'll all work out well in the end. Yeah, yeah. What was it in your upbringing? You know, I think credit goes to my parents, of course. I'm not a parent myself, but seeing how they um, allowed me to grow up, they allowed me to take risks. They also taught me that, um, you know, if you want something in life, you've, you've got to work hard to achieve it. We're not going to pass you anything other than knowledge, um, support and encouragement. And so they have always been there and they've always been enthusiastic. They've always been positive. They've always been setting goals. And I never forget when I first started planning for my travels, you know, I, I, I told my parents I wasn't going to university. That I didn't want to find a job either here, that I just wanted to save m like money with my current job and then eventually travel the world. And, no real plan, but I knew that, that with that life experience, I would find my passion somehow and know what I want to do rather than trying to force something upon myself. And, you know, they could have flipped out on that and, and said it's a bad decision, but they supported it. They were like, if that's what makes you happy, then we're happy too. And as long as you do it properly and it's not reckless, they didn't know about most of the adventures to begin with, um, then, you know, they, they support that. And I remember my dad, you know, calling me outside it was a nice sunny day we were on the on the table and he created this mind map and 
He taught me about breaking down my goals, you know, focusing first on how you're going to get the finance, focusing on selling your car to help with the finance, focus on, on getting a qualification that would enable you to find work abroad so that you can top up the funds whilst traveling. So I then became a scuba diver in the hope that I could find work as a scuba diving instructor when I'm traveling. And so by my dad breaking all of these goals down, he just made it seem so easy because I was 16, 17 at the time. And as I said, no sort of... Um, university education. My parents didn't hand me money. Um, I didn't have no military background. I didn't know I was going to get into this adventure um, sort of career first anyway, but I did have the initial idea that I was interested in survival, into going into the wild. And, you know, when I put that initial plan together and, and broke down the goals, it just made it seem so achievable. So what I think that's parenting. what they did. Mm, what brilliant, yeah, yeah, brilliant yeah. parenting that is. Yeah. So you describe it there the leap stage in many ways but yeah. take us through um on one of uh, the, uh, i keep going back to the yanks of everyone because that's the one that just intrigues me yeah got you. but what was the leap stage then of, of 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 where you've had this idea you've saved all the money up and then describe that first experience of then actually going after the, this call for adventure for the Yangtze River, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so for the Yangtze, I think it was definitely a track habit of the previous experiences and adventures that I that I took on. I did a lot of um, growing up and developed a lot from my early stage adventures where they were reckless and they were dangerous. So now, you know, after Mongolia, which was the first world record, and Madagascar, which was the second, I'd built up a lot of experience. And when I saw the Yangtze for the first time in its might, you know, this is a 4,000 mile journey that took me 352 days to complete. At first, it was immensely daunting. You know, and the fact that it was China with its sensitivities and the fact that I would be near Tibet um, at over 5,000 meters altitude in the west of China. I just knew that this wouldn't be a case of applying for a visa and then going on an, an adventure. I knew that I would need certain permits, fixes on the ground, um, visas. I'd need uh, protection from the authorities. I'd need um, government proof. So it was very daunting at first, but as soon as I saw that, you know, the Yangtze, uh, the Nile River has been walked, the Amazon has been walked. I always wanted to revisit China since 2010. That's when I first went there at age 19. Sort of traveled through China for two weeks. I left and realized, you know, I've barely touched the surface. So China was always there in my mind when I was 19, you know. But you've almost got this, this huge daunting challenge that you're going to take on. Yeah. But, you know, it's that famous story that a journey of a thousand miles begins with that first step. Yeah. What was the first step? that you took then to 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 cover this 4000 mile track it's a it's great that you say that actually because i think with this one um people will be shocked at just how intense it was so with the yangtze it took two years to plan and let's skip all of the logistics and the visas and permits i finally i, I was in yushu which was the closest city to the source of the yangtze river and from there, I needed to get the team because it was all about teamwork and getting to the source and again, the right permits. And our first attempt to the Yangtze River source was a failed attempt. Um, and I remember that now delayed me by two and a half months altogether, which meant I was now putting myself and my, um, the new team that joined me at the source of the Yangtze at the most dangerous time to be there is where wolves and bears are actively on the hunt. It drops to about minus 20. We're at over 5,100 meters, as I said. There were snow blizzards, and I had half of my team on the on the phone saying, you know, it's two and a half months delayed. Maybe abandon it this year and try again next year because you've missed the season. And so taking that first step was it was terrifying and I held a lot of fear, you know, even with the previous experience. I do hold fear, I do hold doubt, but I did believe in the previous experience that I had. I believed that I could get myself and the team off the mountains before the true depth of winter, which would see the winter drop to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Um, and when I took that first step, I, I realised that this was a step that took two and a half months, regardless to the two years trying to plan it, two and a half months to get to the source and start that first step. And I'm already five members down from the last team that tried to join me. So it was daunting, you know, I was a couple of seconds into a 4,000 mile journey. I had already lost five team members. I had already been delayed two and a half months, yet I now had 352 days left to get to the mouth of the Yangtze River where it pours out into Shanghai, into the East China Sea. So it was, it was majorly daunting. 
two things I want to go a bit deeper on with you, if, yeah. if I may. Um, the fact that you still believed you could get that team across that mountain and yes. safe. And also the fact that you had the fear and you still had the doubts. Yeah. Let's go to the first one. Where did the self-belief come from and how do you know the difference and how can our listeners understand the difference between overconfidence and confidence? I would say experience. Experience is something that I didn't have when I started my early adventures and I made a lot of mistakes. I almost died of dehydration. I was held up at gunpoint by the military. I had to cross crocodile infested rivers on rafts that I didn't strap up properly. Um, there were many mistakes along the way that I made, but you know, I believe in that motto, try never to make the same mistake twice. I've always learned, I've never been dehydrated again. The next time I built that raft solidly, we weren't sinking uh, and I've never been held, held up at gunpoint, touch wood, uh, since. So I'm a big believer of building up the track habits, starting small, step by step. There's no way that I could have done the Yangtze if I hadn't done all of those previous adventures and expeditions before. So I would say it was having the confidence and belief that of knowing how capable I am. And that's where I was also able to eradicate fear. I believe fear comes as a package deal. It comes with doubt. So as long as you're fearful of a task, there's always gonna be doubt there that says you can't do it. And the way to eradicate doubt, because I believe you need fear, it keeps you alive. And I'm still fearful of taking on many adventures still to this day. But the one way I believe you can eradicate doubt is through practice, is experience, is through preparation, is through meticulous planning and attention to detail. And so that's what I've done with all these latest expeditions. And another way of looking at those things, being held up at gunpoint, not yeah. building the raft properly, almost dying of dehydration. Mm. They're all failures, right? Yeah. So you are obviously someone that understands the power of failure and yeah. that, as we say often on this podcast, failure is a comma. Not yeah, full stop. exactly. Exactly. hundred percent agree with that. It's always a stepping stone. And I believe I get asked um, this question a lot is if I went back, would I do anything differently? And whilst I wouldn't want to, face dehydration again i think i really needed to to understand how how brutal and how harsh that scenario is and to make sure i never do it again because uh, i could be in a worse off environment where i'm not fortunate enough to make it this time and so i wouldn't change anything because i believe each mistake that i made was was a lesson and a stepping stone that gave me the confidence to pursue the Yangtze regardless of the rest of the team in china and the uk saying don't pursue it wait another year so let's discuss a bit of self-talk then, because as you begin that first step, yeah. really, it is about self-talk. Mm. You're telling yourself everything will be okay, yeah. but you're also reminding yourself there are some dangers ahead. You spend a lot of time on your own. Mm. I'd love for people to really understand the power of how we speak to ourselves. Yeah. What could you share with us that you've learned that people can, maybe techniques and tips that people can take into their own lives yeah. If they struggle with telling themselves that things are going to be okay, people with a negative mindset or an, an anxious approach. Um, I think I'm trying to relate it back now to, to how I've overcome sort of negative talk because I have had it and I've had many naysayers as well. I've got a book called Mission Possible and the reason it's called Mission Possible is in 2014 when I attempted the Mongolia, there were people and Navy soldiers who had attempted but failed were evacuated before or just after the halfway point. And this did scare me, you know, I'm, I was no soldier. I was 23. I was, I was a master scuba diver and an instructor and a Muay Thai fighter trying to fight to compete, to earn money, to pay for my rent in Thailand on an island. I'd never been to a desert and I wasn't military trained. So to have someone say that um, was scary. So, you know, I, I approached more people and I asked them about this Mongolia trip on whether it can be done. And right, so you hoovered up knowledge. Yeah, I hoovered up knowledge, yeah, majorly. I was speaking to those people on the ground who have been to Mongolia, who have crossed the Gobi Desert by any means and asked them for any tips, any advice, um, the dangers to look out for, what I need to prepare for. And I, I pretty much got a, a big team that helped with this, who put it all together and sent it over. And I was a big believer at that time of, you know, just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, and with the self-talk, I what, I what I did then was, and I go back to when my dad taught me this, is I broke the goals down majorly. So whilst all of these people were telling me that this Mongolia journey was impossible, I, acted, I went to the Royal Geographic Society, teamed up there, I got the map work out, and I looked at every single one of those 
um, days. It was anticipated to take about 100 days to cross Mongolia solo and unsupported. And I looked at every single possible day and I, I searched actively for that impossible day not just put the whole expedition down as impossible. I was searching for, if they're saying it's impossible, which one of these days is the impossible day and how can I overcome that day? And when I broke it down like that, I realized that every day was possible. As long as I had the right food supply, as long as I hit the right water points, then there's nothing major enough that could, that could stop me from achieving it. And so I think it was actively breaking the goals down. And, you know, I think a lot of us can learn to manage our expectations and if we don't, the task in hand can be so overwhelming that you can just put it away and change your whole mind. Because that almost happened to me where I just looked into a safer country, more populated country to walk across. I was like, Mongolia, who am I kidding? Which, which brings us then into the third stage, the fight stage, or mm. the messy middle, the bit where you get too far in to go back, but you're not far enough to see the end yet. Yeah. So how yeah. do you deal with those moments when... when when they occur yeah i've got a great answer for that actually um and as soon as you said that it just threw me back to the gobi desert so i was hiking already three weeks over the altai mountains um five weeks across the gobi desert and three weeks across the mongolian steppe and there was a middle section of the gobi desert where i had now missed the point of backup i was suffering with dehydration a water source was dry and the only option for me to survive was was to get up and, and keep walking um, again, I couldn't afford afford no evacuation. So I guess the option there was that I, I had no option physically. It was so you, either... Sorry, you couldn't afford the evacuation? I couldn't afford no evacuation. This was a low-budget expedition. And this was the world See, I, first. I suppose I've always assumed, like, if it's really bad, you can just <laughs> yeah. ring the emergency services, like we would in this country, and say, I'm yeah. going to die here. Yeah, yeah. Whereas on the expeditions you're on, that isn't an option. It was on the latest two. But, but on with, this one. But with Mongolia, yeah, my insurance was invalid. They don't support unsupported hikers or people going to Mongolia. You always have to be in the team just because it's wow. such a harsh environment. And on top of that, I was pulling a trailer behind me, carrying all provisions needed to survive. And that was 120 kilograms or 18 stone. Um, what happened? And I was, I was weak. I was severely dehydrated. On, I was suffering with heat stroke, which is usually fatal. I could almost feel my organs drying up. I was hallucinating, I was delirious. And I remember I would have to hide under my trailer because picture the Gobi Desert, it's fast, it's 40 degrees Celsius plus. There's no wind, there's no shelter even from the clouds. And I, my only protection was underneath my trailer on the, on the hard, you know, rocky floor. And it was a mix between gravel and soft sand. And I remember, I say missed the point of pickup because I had continued and there was an unconfirmed water source that was now dry, which was, which was fine. You know, I knew to carry enough water in my container to last me an unconfirmed water source because there was always going to be a confirmed water source coming next. We'd never like two unconfirmed, unconfirmed water sources in a row. However, in the Gobi Desert, you go through water a lot quicker and I was a lot skinnier. I was a lot weaker and I was pulling this trailer that was like pulling a concrete block through hell, hiding under my trailer. And it was at that point I realized that I think I only have potentially three, four days um, in me left because I was in such a bad agonizing way. How long had this gone on for? This had got, I had slipped into it, I think over the past two weeks, but I think it was probably longer because when I was in the Altai Mountains and it was colder, I probably wasn't taking in as much fluid because it didn't feel like I needed to. Rookie error. Uh, and at the point where I was underneath the trailer, I did have an agent in the capital in Ulaanbaatar, but it would take him at least three to four days to find me if he found me in time and another day or two to get me out of that that area. And for me, I didn't believe I could survive five to six days. So how did you cope? I mean, just as you're describing it, I can feel the panic rising up in me for you <laughs> at this moment. And, yeah. and, and we know you survived, but yeah. when you don't have that guarantee, like how did you deal with the panic, the fear, the terror that must have been engulfing you? It's weird. It came gradually. It hit me gradually, but when it hit me, it hit me hard. Um, and I was thinking about family members. I was thinking about friends. I was... I was kind of feeling sorry for myself at the beginning, like not sorry for myself, but you know, I, I never like being that kind of person. And I was that kind of person. I was under my trail. I was like, just damn it. How did I go wrong? You know, how do I get out of this scenario? And I found myself very much on the negative side and almost accepting that I might, I might die. Um, and I think to flip that again, I focused on what I could do. 
I focused on those four days that I believe I can stay alive, I believe I can walk to that next community, which was guaranteed as confirmed, not only water source, but a community of people. And I still had four remaining days left. And I'm a big believer of the, the law of attraction, visualization, but I couldn't visualize four days. I was in agony, but I could visualize 100 meters. And again, that's when the break in the goals that I, I could see 100 meters. So there was no reason why I couldn't get up from out of my trailer, strap my four point harness on, walk for 100, maybe 200 meters if I was lucky, and then rest under the trailer again. And then I became really disciplined uh, and routined. I would rest sometimes for an hour under my trailer, whereas I nipped that in the bud and rested for no more than five minutes before I got up and continued. Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you, um, when you started this story, you went, I've got a great story here. Yeah. What you didn't say was, I've got an awful story about this. Yeah, right? true. So when you get to the end of this and you yeah. survived and you come out the other side, do you go, that was pretty cool. That was kind of close. That was, that was amazing. Yeah. I think maybe you do. Um, I, I didn't at first. But now? Now I do. Now I'm like, oh God, because it's over, you know? And does it's it over. add then to your self-belief and your confidence that things will be okay? It does, because you start, you start realising, and I think there's a lesson for everyone as well, is how much I doubted myself, how much fear I had, as, as I mentioned. But since those expeditions, I've actually realised how capable I am. Um, and I believe that is a message for everyone is that you're so much more capable than you give yourself credit for. Like there's so much that you can do, but just because you haven't built up the track habits or experienced it before, a lot of people put the, the self-talk, which is usually negative, and put themselves off. Because you're talking a lot here about mindset mm. as opposed to necessarily physical capability. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, I've seen an answer that you've given in the past to this, but I'd be interested in, in how you'd apportion how much of your success is down to mindset as opposed to yeah. your physical capability. Yeah, yeah. I always say it's 70% mindset and 30% physical. You definitely need both. But I think we we all have a powerful mind, you know, and we all, all have that instinct to survive. Um, and I believe that is just covered in a layer of dust for many people. But when you're out there and you're put into a scenario like that, you realize just how much you can, how far you can dig deep, you know and you can pull yourself out of the gutter or pull yourself out of scenarios like the Gobi. There's a real challenge though for people here mm. because what you're saying is the place where you find that self-belief yeah. is also the place where the self-doubt lives. Yeah. And you know, I think that courage and fear live in the same place within us yeah. because we have to get, we have to have the fear first because for then sure. it's the courage that comes and pushes us exactly. through that. Exactly, yeah, yeah. But there'll be people listening to this that they can't go to the place of fear. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's true. So it's just how we can how we can encourage. If someone comes to you and says, "I really want to be a, and I want to be the next Ash Dykes. I really want to explore the world, but I'm just too scared." What do you say to them to get past the fear and find the courage? Yeah, I've had that a lot, and I I say start local, start local, build up some experience, start these adventures. As I mentioned, you know, before the Yangtze River. I was cycling across Vietnam or I was just hiking in the mountains for a day and I was building up that experience and, and you know, where it was a one day hike, it became a week hike, then a two week hike. It wasn't a full year hike straight away. I, I built it up and eradicated the doubt um, with cool. that with that experience. And that would always be my message is, is start small. You don't need to go up here straight away. And I believe it's like with any career we're working towards, you can't jump up to the top of the ladder straight away. You've got to start on the first step and climb your way up that ladder. It's good this, Damien, because if you want to have a six pack, well, you start by just eating better. Yeah. Mm. And if you want to build a billion pound business, you start by setting up the business. Yeah, yeah. You don't go straight in at the top. And I think, you know, people see the end goal too often. And as Ash describes, and I'm sure that there's plenty of research that's gone into this, if we break things down into the small, the small elements, the small steps, you know, don't look at the whole wall, just see the individual bricks. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, what Ash is describing here, if I can just, and, and correct me if I'm, if yeah. I'm paraphrasing correctly, Ash, sure. is that there's three, there's three types of goals, isn't there? There's the outcome goal of, of going the whole length of the Yangtze River and feeling like yeah. you're inspiring people that are that are watching you mm. there's a process of measuring that it's four thousand miles and then there's the process of going one mile and then doing another mile after that so it's about breaking it down into those exactly yeah so when people talk about yeah. like trust the process yeah you're right that's where it sounds yeah. like your mindset is. yeah exactly and that's why it was an interesting question that you asked at the start was um, what does high performance mean to you? And that's why I said it's achieving something or working at a certain level, but keeping that consistency. 
it's like when I left the source of the Yangtze River and that was one day down, that's great, but I now need to keep going for another 351 days to complete it. Yep. So it's not just having a good day of covering good miles. You need to be doing that every single day. To and are you to doing that with six days to go? Are you still going one more day, one more day? Or is there yeah. a moment where you go, ah, yeah. oh, we're done. I've done it. I've completed it. And yeah. maybe that's risky. I don't know. Yeah, yeah you're right. That's a good one. Yeah, no one's ever said that. But you are 100% right with that. You get to a certain point in your mind. Again, as it comes back to the mind where, for example, after six months, all of the dangers were behind me. Um, six and then, months. <laughs> yeah, after six, and then towards the second half of the Yangtze trip, I was coming across more, more cities. You know, I was following now a tarmac um, road. And it became difficult because after eight months, when I've only got, say, two, three months left, I, I knew that I had done it. I knew that I completed it, but I haven't completed it until I've smashed out that tarmac road fully, you know? Yeah. See, because this is stage four. Uh, this is a stage four. This is the climb bit now. So now that you can, like, mountain yeah. climbers often say the two most dangerous periods of climbing a mountain are when you can see the peak and when yeah. you've just left the peak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're in that relaxed state. You know yeah. you can get there. And then you've already been there, so you relax standards. So how do you deal with with that? Again, I think I keep that end goal in mind and I, I break it down day by day. I try to enjoy the process. And what I've learned from almost dying in the Gobi Desert is to not rush that process because bad things do happen. Um, and in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, I was trying to rush the process. Um, and maybe I wouldn't have got dehydration as quickly if I wasn't trying to use all of that daylight, if I wasn't trying to get 20, 30 miles, maybe if I slowed the pace down and looked after myself a little bit more uh, and just focused on the end goal without rushing there, I would have, you know, done it without almost dying. And so I think it is that um, don't, get, don't get carried away um, sort of ethos, isn't it? Just enjoy the moment, stay in the moment, take your time and, and still pace it out day by day. You're going to get there. So you're checking in with yourself all the time mentally, particularly yeah. when you're on your own. Yeah. And you've, you've mentioned that, you know, uh, manifestation is something that you indulge in, believing great things are going to happen, a positive yeah. mindset. Can you talk a bit more on that for us? Because yeah. there are still real naysayers that go, of course, believing something can happen doesn't make it happen. Yet, yeah. You, as you've just said, 70% of the amazing things you've achieved are because you believe you can achieve them. Yeah, it's what are interesting. Your processes? Well, because when I say as well, like visualization, I think a lot of people, what they do is they'll visualize the highlights, they'll visualize the positive uh, or the positivity, they'll visualize the end goal of making wherever they're trying to get to. I'll flip that and I'll do it completely different. I'll actually visualize the dark times. I'll actually visualize and look into what it will be like uh, what it will feel like to be lonely, what it will be like to, to be dehydrated, you know, how I will react or feel with a pack of wolves on the hunt or surrounding me, you know, to, in a snow blizzard. And time and time again, actually, when I've been training, because I train a lot physically, but I train physically to help prepare mentally. And when I'm out there, for example, I came back from Thailand. Um, I moved back into my parents' place in Wales. I had, no, I had about 200 pounds to my name. I had this big idea of doing Mongolia. It was a world first, but I had no finance. So when I came back home, my uncle dropped me off a tractor tire because I couldn't afford no gym membership. And every morning with my sledgehammer and tractor tire, I'd be out there 6, 7 a.m. Winter, summer, it didn't matter. I'd be grinding. As, and as I'm training, I'm telling myself or I'm trying to put myself in certain scenarios. If there's going to be wolves, expect to be attacked. If there's going to be blizzards, expect them to be the biggest and the baddest. Not because I want to face the biggest, but if I'm thinking of worst case scenario and worst case was unfortunately bound to happen, it won't approach me by surprise, which will send me into flight rather than fight. Yep. It comes as something I, I anticipated, I expected. So now I've got to just crack on and, and get through it. Now, there was one of those stats that you mentioned there mm. that, that I think is more pragmatic for people listening to this, that yeah. those of us that won't be, that hopefully not hunted down by wolves. Yeah. But something that I think is a pandemic of a different kind in our modern world, yeah. which is loneliness. Yeah. So what tips have you got for coping with loneliness or having those times where you feel isolated or without, without help? Routine, I would say, is having a solid routine. And I can relate because when I came back after the Yangtze, it was pretty much straight into the lockdown. So after all of that freedom for the whole year, it was back. It was straight back into the house, into lockdown. Um, and it, I think it affected us all mentally. And I think it affected everyone's business careers. It affected some part of it, of each individual was affected. And for me, it was the it was the mindset. 
And how I got out of that was by setting up a daily routine. And I know a lot of people, again, I know it's easier said than done. Uh, and some people just want to chill. But I'm of that mindset. If you can if you can remain disciplined and if you can remain consistent, you're going to see better days. You're going to see um, good times again. You know, like the bad storm it hasn't come to stay. It's come to pass. If you can remain happy in that in that storm, in that bad time and stay consistent with the routine. And that can be something as getting up at this time, going for a morning run or having a pint of water or making a healthy breakfast just with an end goal that at the end of the day, if you can tick off just 50% of those things that you had on the lift, uh, on the list, you, f- you just naturally feel good about yourself. And that's what I've learned from the extremes that I've brought back to everyday life. It is that consistency, it is that routine. And it's fine if some days you're down as well. There were many days that I just hated it. There were many times in Madagascar, for example, when I was in the jungle, lost in the jungle, machete in hand. I'm only covering a distance of one to two miles in 14 hours of hiking. I've got leeches falling on me. It's the cyclone season. You've got blisters everywhere. I had spider bites. You're hungry, you're thirsty. And I hated the jungle at one stage. I I developed a dark mindset. I hated being there. I had a team, but I had to show that I loved being there. I was hiding my hiding my thoughts and my feelings because I had to remain strong because they're looking to me. And if they see me down, it makes it more acceptable for them to be down. It felt like I was the pillar of the team and had to somehow hold us together. And I did. I, I looked for... I looked for answers. I was like, how can I do this? You know, I'm hating it. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm bleeding everywhere. I've got blisters. All of my toenails have dropped off. Blisters on my hand from the machete, from bushwhacking. And for me, again, it was tomorrow was another day. You know, the next day I would aim to cover this amount of mileage. Even if it was one mile, I would target it whereby we share hacking duty. And we hack 50 meters at a time before we share hacking duty. You know, and by just keeping that routine, I just found that in the jungle and back at home in isolation it really helped me through because as you're describing that of like leading the team through the jungle there it, like i'm thinking of another great explorer shackleton mm. when yeah, he kept his exactly. team alive uh, yeah 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 um, on, um in, in, in that particular yeah. incident how much did you have you researched sort of people that have been amazing explorers themselves and taken their techniques and applied them to the modern day. You know, I should research a lot more, a lot more than I than I do. But with myself, it just kind of accidentally happened. Just do I, it. Yeah, I never knew that I would I would be doing this. You know, my idea was be a Muay Thai fighter and, and scuba dive in Thailand, and then in the off season, I'll go over and be maybe a snowboard or skiing instructor in Canada. You know, that was my idea, just like building up that decent lifestyle that I enjoyed. But with these adventures, it just kept triggering that that passion. And then I was always like wondering what what's next, what's next. And so it happened for the first sort of five years that I was away traveling where I wasn't sort of researching or looking into other people and what they're doing. I was just too busy purchasing 10 pound bicycles and, and going off and seeing what <laughs> happens. But now that I hear more of these stories, it's just, it blows my mind. And I don't take inspiration only from the explorers, you know, yeah. from so many people in different industries, uh, you know, who are going against the odds and working hard to achieve what many people say. Can't like who, be for example? Like, like who do you look to? Do you learn oh, from? Oh, oh, many. It can be. It can be from the corporate world, say Richard Branson. It could be from the um, Olympics, like Usain Bolt from the boxing, the Floyd Mayweather, Conor McGregor. You know, these different people who come up from from difficult upbringings and uh, or the normal upbringing, but but still manage to proceed and, and uh, win at what they're doing, you know? So now we arrive. We've reached the arrive stage. Um, lots of people live an outcome-based life. I'll be happy when I get the house. I'll be content when I get that new car. I'll have a smile on my face when I get a promotion. What would you like to tell people about the risks of living a life based solely on the outcome? Or maybe... The outcome is what it's all about for you and not the process. No, yeah, you're right. For me, it was definitely the process. And I, a lot of people gave me a hard time when it was down to the process. Because, you know, as a youngster, I was never really money motivated. I was just, just all about ticking off amazing experiences, you know, sort of having this bucket list and going out there and being that poor man who financially, who goes out there and, and creates these epic experiences so that at the end of my days, I can look back and think, and even if I get man. to 40, yeah, and yeah. think, you know, I'm only 40, but wow, what a life I've lived to, to 80 in my mind. And so I was always like that. That's until probably five years ago when I realized like, yes, you have to be realistic and you, and you need finance too. Um, but you don't need a lot. And 
I think the journey is far more important than the destination because when I look back to these previous expeditions, it's never crossing the finish line that has been the highlight. You know, there's been a million highlights in between the start and the finish that stand out much more than crossing that finish line. So when you do arrive, though, what, what processes do you go to to distill all the learnings, all the amazingly rich experiences together before you decide to plan the next adventure? Yeah, it's funny because I think I actually indirectly plan the next whilst I'm on the current. And again, that's not sort of in a cocky way. I think that's in a way that pushes and motivates me that little bit more. It's like with Mongolia, although I was struggling in Mongolia, I was thinking of Madagascar, you know, the locals there, the culture, the diversity. Um, and it actually helped me to push on Mongolia because then I realized that, hang on, if I don't do Mongolia, I can't go to Madagascar, you know? So it would always be that. I would always be planning a step ahead of myself. And then when I was in Madagascar, I was thinking about and planning the Yangtze, thinking if I can't complete these 155 days in Madagascar, I don't stand a chance against the 352-day expedition in, in China. Um, and so I do always kind of, kind of plan ahead. But is it not a danger there that because you're always looking that far ahead, you miss some of the big lessons yeah and for the lessons i guess because i'm out there especially mongolia when i was completely solo every sort of lesson that happens or experience um that i have i've got another like sort of 14 16 hours of walking by myself so it's enough time to absorb because a lot of people also ask like when you're out there in the wild and you've done sort of all of this wilderness trekking and the challenges and the survival it must be intense when you get back to the corporate world when you get back to the city but it 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 doesn't happen within the blink of an eye there's a long process and by the time I actually cross that finish line and I'm back into civilization it's more of it's it's about damn time you know it's like thank god I'm, I'm here I don't think it's kind of like a, a, a race and track where Usain Bolt for example he's at the start line and in however long in nine seconds he'll know whether he is the champ or not and then I can imagine a feeling like that being so overwhelming that it would be hard to reflect because then the press are instantly on you within that nine seconds and the world's shouting about you. As, whereas with this Yangtze, I'm able to process it and then I realise I've only got a month left, I've only got three weeks, two weeks left, a week left, so I'm able to analyse and by the time um, the other side hits, which is the corporate side or the, the civilization, I'm ready for it. So when you go into the corporate world now, so you've said that like, as, as, the, as the adventures have become bigger and more complex, mm. you realise that you needed to get funding and support and things like that. Yeah. I think what would be really quite helpful for me to understand, but for listeners as well, is how do you go and persuade somebody to write a cheque to do this? So I'd, like, getting people to buy into your vision or your dream. Yeah. Tell us about that. It's the hardest thing ever. <laughs> it's so hard. Oh, many times where... Many times where, of course, I've just self-funded because it's, it's just not happening. Um, and other times where I couldn't self-fund because I didn't have the funds, so I was close to, to calling it off completely. Um, and so I think everyone has their own individual way. The way I did it was pretty reckless, I would say, with the Yangtze one especially. So with the Yangtze, I didn't actually have the visa. <laughs> I think this is the first podcast I've said this on. It's hilarious. I didn't actually have the visa, the permits, or the finance to make it happen. <laughs> And none of my team were, were sort of working hard as well. And, and I was just like, oh, I keep chasing them, but there's there's no response yet, you know. And it, they were kind of like saying, you won't do it this year, you'll probably do it next year. And they were kind of finding ways and excuses to put it off. And I realized that, how do I how do I kick them up the ass politely? And I was like, maybe if I pu pull together a press release, if I announce it to the world, you know, go to the BBC, go to all of these channels and, and, and say what I'm doing, but attach these names to it, you know, my, my fixes and logistics manager in China attach their name to it so they can see <laughs> their name is now people are looking to them to help make this happen. And I did. And it actually, it was a huge risk. My parents and my family friends advised me fully against it. They said it's reckless. <laughs> and, and when you can't do it, you know, it'll be bad for your name. But it worked. Surprise, it was, it was a 50-50 risk, you know, but it, it worked. They started working hard. They didn't want to let the expedition Brilliant. down. And that's when I think we got then more brands and partners and sponsorship on board. And, and it actually happened. And there's like, true power in that. I mean, we've spoken to lots of people who've yeah. said that the day that they felt they really had to make something happen was the day they wrote it down. You know, Casper yeah. Schmeichel, the goalkeeper. Yeah. He'd always dreamed of winning the Premier League. And, he's, and someone said, well, 
tell people then. And he, all it was, he went to a school and he said, do you know what? One day I'm going to win the Premier League. From the minute he said that to those kids, that was the moment he had to make it happen. Yeah. And again, writing that contract with yourself publicly can be such a powerful motivating factor for you and everyone around you. Yeah. Yeah, 100% I agree. And, you know, those kids will hold him accountable then. They'll hold him to the word of being a, you know, but um, it, it seemed to have worked for me. Uh, you know, I don't want to have to do that again. <laughs> but, but you might do. So next time a press release comes out, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I start to up something. I'm going to message you and say, have you got the money? Um, exactly. Look, before we move on to our, our quickfire questions, yeah. I've, I've loved this conversation because the overriding thought that keeps coming into my head is optimism, optimism. And I, we all see people that live a life where they allow the fear to control what they think they can or can't do mm. rather than allowing the optimism to control what they, they can or can't do. I've said before, you know, my wife's favourite phrase is I'm, I'm worried, I haven't worried enough. Oh, like, I that, that. like that's going to do something good, you know? Yeah. yeah. Whereas you've got the total opposite mindset. So going back to the darkest, the most difficult moments where your life is literally on the line, how much time in those moments... And how much energy are you putting into the thought that the worst can happen? Or is it 100% about the positive and that I can do this and the optimism? I, I just want people to realise how futile and pointless negative thoughts are. Yeah, yeah. I would say with that, it was probably 90-10. There's a 10% because it's not a case of winning or losing. It's a case of living or dying. There's a 10% that that just sinks in the brain just for a split second before I can nip it in the bud or eradicate that and then the 90% I'm relying on to take over because it's the 90% that's going to pick me up from under that trailer and push me onto the next water source that 10% is not going to do anything and a perfect example of that um, would be and this is a bit of a wild story but when I was in Madagascar as well and after everything that I faced I actually contracted the deadliest strain of malaria which was falsiparum and I remember I was taking my anti-malaria pills, but I still had this malaria. I was delirious. I was hallucinating yet again. And I had five days to walk to the next community, which had overland transport to get me to the um, hotel because I had malaria. I couldn't go to a, um, a hospital. I needed to stay quarantined. And as I was walking, I remember the, the morning that I woke up, the, the very morning that I, I needed to get to that hospital or, or that hotel, I had two voices inside me. And one of the voices was just, stay asleep it'll be a painless death you'll just drift off and that's it and there was another side bearing in mind it was hallucinating delirious all sorts was going on was screaming at me get up get yourself up push on to that to that hospital and I lit that's the that's the voice I listened to and I did get up and you know I went from being strong and and capable to then not being able to pick up a glass of, of water you know I lost all my strength but I was able to push on enough to get to that hotel and when the doctor took my blood she said potentially a few hours later and you would have slipped into a coma wow. and so that's the difference of listening to that negative side in which i would have died or listening to that scream inside saying get up push on otherwise you're going to die and i that's that's the side i listened to the positive side not the negative and it made all the difference wow bloody hell what an amazing conversation <laughs> um listen we always end with our quick fire questions. Sure. And the first one is, what are the three non-negotiables? And this is great for you because you build teams all the time to take with you on a life or death missions. What are yeah. the three non-negotiables that you and the people around you have to buy into to be part of your world? You mean like characteristics? Enthusiasm has to be first. Enthusiasm, kindness. Because when you're out there in the, in the thick of it with... You know, going through a tough time with someone, if they're not kind, you're going you, you're gonna to be in for a rough rough ride. So I like to say that I'm kind on my, to my team and enthusiastic um, and loyal. I would say those are the three, uh, and with loyal faults in trust. So I'd say loyalty and trust, and that goes to um, businesses as well when they're looking at, at teamwork. You know, you, you want a good, solid, loyal and trustworthy team. You want someone who is enthusiastic. You point to the top of that mountain, it looks ridiculous and then you think of all of the challenges and obstacles, but they're like, we got it, let's do it. And then kindness, because they're the ones that aren't going to leave you behind. They're going to pick you up when you're down and you're going to pick them up when they're down. If you could go back to one moment in your life, what would it be and why? Oh, that's such a good one. Oh God, I don't know. I don't know. Um... I think it is going to have to be maybe in one of these communities far like far in the, in the wilderness, could be in the middle of the desert, could be in the middle of Madagascar, where I was just sat down with a local community 
nothing but smiles. We couldn't communicate. We had to draw in the sand and like do hand gestures to communicate. But they took me in like I was a brother, you know, and then pushing on from that, realizing I'm never going to be back here and I'm never going to see those people again. Yet they've provided me with warmth, with drink, and I've got to see their way of life. And there's something special knowing that that's just a brief human encounter out there in the absolute wilderness. And I think one, ma one particular community that comes in mind is one that I left and I looked at the map to try to see what it was called and it wasn't even on the map. Wow. I was like, wow, I'm, uh, you know, I'm never going to see it again. <laughs> what a privilege though. Yeah, it what was amazing. Privilege. It was amazing. Um, how important is legacy to you? Um, legacy. I think we all want to leave something behind, whether that's large for the world to see or small, you know, just for your family. Um, and so I... It's, it's, it's big. I don't really know how to answer that one. That's a good question. Do you think about it? I never used to, but now I kind of have been thinking about it with the book that's out, um, with it being three world records and, and with people um, writing to me, like planning their own expeditions and me being able to help maybe the bigger footprint and getting the awareness out there. And hence why now I'm working more with TV, get the message out there further. And I think it also have to say that you know, I've done these expeditions, but they've not just been for adventure's sake. I've actually partnered with organizations and charities and helped raise funds, but also helped raise awareness. So for Mongolia, I was raising awareness about climate change and the effects it has on the nomadic way of life, trying to give back to the locals in the country. Madagascar was for the Lima Network Conservation and raising funds and awareness for all the amazing work they're doing to protect the unique biodiversity of the island. And then um, with the Yangtze, it was pollution. So when I say legacy, it's not in a case of sort of look at me, look at how I've achieved this. It's in a whole well-rounded message of you can do good whilst helping other people along the way. And, and, and the un the real, helping the real unsung heroes yeah. is what I call them, the conservationists, the environmentalists. And if you can project their voice louder, then that's a win-win for me. What advice would you give to a teenage Ash in North Wales just starting out? that you are far more capable than you give yourself credit for. I think I take it back to that. And whatever you're planning, go for it. You'll have naysayers and you'll have this idea. You just It's important to understand that it doesn't matter if no one else sees it for you. What's important is if you can see it for yourself. Beautiful. And our final question um, is kind of your last message, really, to the people that have been absorbed by this conversation and it has been brilliant. Um, what would you say is your one golden rule for living a high performance life? My one golden rule would be to enjoy the process, but to remain disciplined. Uh, I think anything, and it's so cliche, and you know, you're probably sick of it because you get so many sort of high performers on this podcast, but I think it is that grind and that t determination to, to just keep going. Uh, you're going to have off days, you're going to have up days, there's highs and lows. I think if you can stay on your grind, you, you're going to get to where you're trying to get to eventually. It's only a matter of time. Lovely. Brilliant. Thank you so much for taking Thank the time. Thank you for having me. Much appreciated. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.